Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to the Steel City um, with one of the tallest and nicest guys in the fancy. We're going to have some real issue with perspective here because um, because I'm at least six foot something. I'm not, uh, but Russ is dead tall. Um, so we are with um, an absolute thoroughly lovely chap, uh, a champion um, whippet breeder is that that yeah, is right isn't yeah, it that's the, yeah. that, I've, I've can't get I've, I've got to get the terminology right you, you, we don't actually get classed as champion right. breeders like you're doing birds but right. I have bred a few champions <laughs> yeah yeah he's bred one or two champions we're going to see one of them later everybody stunning stunning if the canary room was bigger who knows I might bring a couple of whippets back with me but that's for another day um we have of course we're with <laughs> with Russell Sykes Russ as we affectionately call him um so today we're going to look at a number of things in his wonderful bird rooms. I say rooms in plural. We're going to look at some of his fantastic Yorkshire canaries. He's got a very nice stud of five canaries as well. And they're not content with having those. You've got, you've gone all continental on us, haven't you? Belgian Bossu. Yeah. Belgian Bossu have joined as well, yeah. Belgiums as well. So there's uh, type and posture in this room today, everyone. So listen, it's going to be another belter. I feel it. I feel it already. So you know what to do. Grab yourself a cuppa, sit back, and enjoy the show. T tell us about the room, Ross. So it's it's got the height to it, yeah. mate, hasn't it? It needed the height. It, it needs the it height. Did. Not for when, me, it doesn't, but Ross needs the height. When, when I was ringing up, getting quotes for it, uh, what made me laugh, I, I think I rung one guy up and he said, well, it'll be £1,500 for a 12b6. Uh, he said, but you can go two boards higher if you want for another 400 quid. He says, that's called premium. And I thought, well, for another 400 quid, it needs to be premium. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got... So, what, what, what size is this, Russ? This it's, is uh, 18 by 8. 18 by 8, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. a lovely, lovely size room. And, and one of the things that you, you mentioned before, you, you were talking about the sort of, you know, I say it a lot when we do the Canary Room. We, we talk about setups and sheds and, and cages and, and it, you know there's a lot of money involved in in starting things and, and as you just said you know you you had a different shed mm. you talked before off camera about the position where you put the shed and mm. um, but none of those things none of those things should deter people should they from from joining it's just i guess mm. the lesson you'd say what if you were doing it again russ what would you do Pla plan think yeah go as big as you possibly yeah. could go, if, if you're going to take it seriously like i said and, and, and you know you're going to be at it for a few years and you, you, you know you want to do well and, and keep a certain amount of birds um, make sure your shed is as big as possible to start with um, and uh, you can never have enough cages can you no you know <laughs> <laughs> so yeah uh, things I, I did wrong like I said the, the initial shed were, weren't quite big enough um, it were it were north facing as well which I think impacted not the best breeding season last year um, so when we built this one we did everything right we went up two boards so it was two boards higher we added another six foot on and another two foot front to back and it's a massive difference and yeah. I think the results in breeding this year have, have, have proved it's, it's airy it's light yeah. and it, it does make a difference to yeah. birds Matt definitely and I think that I think that's one of the things you can't, it's hard for you guys because you're watching this on film but it is it's, it is a nice airy and, and well thought through it's a considered shed Russ so let, let's talk about the cages so we've got we've got just sort of to my left and your right I think probably as you look at it guys we've got a bank um, a block of, uh, of 16 cages and um, there, there looks to be a decent decent height on them are they are they just the standard 12 inches high or are they a bit higher yeah they're, they're the 12 inches Matt 16, right. 16 inch cage fronts yeah um, and uh, what what I what I thought was I wanted all Yorkshires along this side yeah um, in, in slightly bigger I think they're 24 inch uh, gill cages and then the two banks of uh, 16 foot fives but it, it just seemed to work quite well for me yeah no it does and so you mentioned it you've got the the, the sort of plastic cages our friend Dave Rands and mm. um, plastic cages here from Dave and then on the on the wall just behind us and then you've got the the beast cages here haven't you mate the gi the gihu cages here yeah. Yeah, I mean they're they're not cheap, and I suppose they they're not essential. Um, but again, when you when you've got quite a few birds, it makes cleaning out that much easier. Yeah. I do find them very hygienic as well. They, yeah. They're so easy to clean. Yeah. When you're working full time, and you've got other interests. It, it just makes things easier. Yeah. You know, from a management point of view, um, 
the very deep with the drawers as well, so you don't get much mess. Uh, and he, he, I, I find them perfect. Yeah, uh, they, they do work really well, especially for the Yorkshires. And I yeah. think that's one of the things, isn't it, with the Yorkies? You particularly, and, and you know, one of the reasons that my cages in the Canary Room are not are not high enough for the, the sort of the, the, the taller Canaries, really, because what you don't want, and we'll talk about this a lot throughout the show, and y you know. Y chair of the uh, the YCC um, but you've not been in Yorkshire's particularly long no, mate no I haven't no um, I've always had birds from being quite young I've had mixed avers and things like that um, but you've got a lot to answer for really because we we're through watching your show uh, that all this has come about to be honest so a lot of it's down to you and it's cost me a fair, a fair few quid so. <laughs> sorry Russ <laughs> sorry but um, <laughs> no I have an absolute passion for Yorkshire's yeah um, I'm very very keen to establish my own line and um, uh, hopefully, you know, move things forward. Um, I've got involved with Yorkshire Canary Club, um, which I thoroughly enjoy. Um, but yeah, I am probably up first step, let's say, uh, as regards to my birds. But it's it's a learning it's a learning curve. They do offer a lot of challenges, but they're very rewarding as well. Yeah. And when you see when you breed your own and the parent reared and you see them chipping out it makes it all worthwhile yeah. you come each shed on that morning and you've got Yorkshire chicks and my heart skips a beat it's, it's just brilliant yeah. yeah and I think that's that's important isn't it with the, with the bigger canaries that's one of the interesting things first question I asked Russ when we came into the room was um, are they feeding their own and, and they are yeah. <laughs> which is yeah. great yeah um, I think uh, Different people might use feeders, and that's that's entirely up to them. But personally, if you can get an end line which will self rear in the long run, then you, you're off to a winner. I, I I do really firmly believe that. It was no coincidence to me that last year uh, a hen that reared her own three chicks, a hen from that nest this year has reared six. Yeah, all self reared, no problems whatsoever. I pair bred that pair. The cock were good as gold. Some just do it. Yeah, I, I personally, from experience, well, small amount of experience that I've got is some of them just do it. Yeah. And to me, obviously, you've got to bear the quality of the bird in mind, but they're the birds to build around. Yeah, yeah. Moving that's... forward because it makes things so much easier. Yeah. And I, and I think that's the thing, isn't it? That sort of you know having that parent reared line, that feeding line, is really important. You talk about your your inexperience with with the birds, Russ, and and you. I, you you, you do yourself a disservice slightly because you are first and foremost a stockman um, mm. and whether that was as a kid rabbits yeah I had rabbits I had Polish rabbits which were nasty little things that used to bite you I think I've still got some scars <laughs> but from from being a young lad uh, I was a stockman and I were obsessed with it I loved it colour genetics I'm interested in um, even even when I were a schoolboy, I used to take me, take me, get on a coach and take them down to Birmingham and show at national shows. And I've always had that competitive streak in me, if you like, yeah. um, challenging myself to breed the best possible quality I can. And that's what fascinates me about livestock. Um, so I started off with rabbits. And then when I were, got to about 16 years old, um, I got a job at Ullerton Stadium, which is a ground racing track in Sheffield. And I um, got to know one or two of trainers down there, brilliant guys. And I started parading some at Dogs Round Track before the race and fell in love with greyhounds. And we lived in a small terraced house then in Hillsborough. And I, I come home one day and said to my mum, I'm going to get a greyhound, I'm going to get a retired greyhound. They said, they're far too big, Rush, you're not having a greyhound. You can have a little whip it. So me being me, <laughs> approached top breeder in country and, and bought a bitch from him, Phil, he's a Sheffielder as well. Um, and took that bitch back to his champion dog and bang it, it, it went from there and I got the showing book for Whippets and built my own line up over the last 25 years and I think it's fair to say now that 
I've achieved most things that I want to achieve in dogs without being, um, you know, there's a mo- try, trying to be modest. There's a, um, there's a modesty to him when he says he's achieved most things. When we think about, you know, um, dogs and, and breeding and things, and we think about best in shows, and you've got a number of dogs that have won a number of best in shows, and then there's this little dog show, mm. and to the untrained eye, we're like, how have you got on at Crofts? Mm. Um, but actually, the, the 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 dogs that you've had and, and the bitches that you've had and that, that you've bred, they they've done very well, haven't they? On the on the bench, they, they have. I mean, when it comes to showing that, um, I enjoy showing, and it's same with dogs as it is with birds. For me, the fascination with livestock is breeding, testing yourself to breed specimens of that breed which are as close to the ideal as possible. Yeah. Now, for me, a show is basically, um, it's somebody else backing up what you're showing being just about what it needs to be, being a very good example of that specific breed. So, I think breeders, in whatever they breed, should have that ideal in their head, what they're trying to breed, and stick to it. And whatever, if, if somebody comes along and breeds a completely different type, don't be waved off where you want to go. Stick to what you want to achieve. Yeah. Keep going, and you'll get there eventually. But yeah. the key is to stick into your guns and having that absolute ideal in your head yeah. of what you're trying to breed. Because I do think some people, in whatever it is they breed, they, they keep going for years and years and years, and really they don't know what they're trying to breed. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's fair, mate. And as we, as you come into the room, there is a. There's a friendly reminder, isn't there, on the uh, on a little whiteboard on the side of the cages there of the yeah. things. You know, we've got models, copies of the models, copies of the, the points for, for both of the birds in here. But there's a friendly reminder as you get on that door of what you're looking for. Yeah, that's just uh, to remind me the... Uh the real important things that I would look for in a Yorkshire canary, which are the length, the taper, the legs and the leg position, the feather quality, the head. The, 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 basically, when you look at that, that points breakdown, the, the, where all your top points are for, and what do you really need to, what do you need really yeah. to get a top Yorkshire? So I just put it on a whiteboard, so every time I come, it shed it's in there I think it might take different people different amounts of time for it to sink in but once that is sunk in there then you you can really go for what you're aiming for you know super stuff everybody if that hasn't wet, wetted your appetite I have no idea what will stay tuned more coming up so when we're looking at a whippet We've got to remember what what it were actually bred for, and it were to uh, to hunt and chase small game basically. Uh, they were created by miners in north of England to basically put a, a meal on table. But the essence of a whippet, as I say, it's a hunting breed and it's built for speed. It's a sprinting dog, so it needs to move very quickly over a short distance. So everything about it is to make it move as fast as possible and be a bit of a powerhouse, but also a killer. It's a side hound, so it hunts by side. So if we start at the head and you look at the overall shape, everything is aerodynamic. Like an aeroplane's got a pointy nose, a whippet should have a long, lean head. You don't want a big square head that's running and turning in fields. You want an aerodynamic head and it should be long and lean. The first part, when, when we're looking, is the muzzle and the underjaw. And they used to be called snap dogs, because when they hunt, they literally snap. We want a real strong depth of chin and a strong muzzle. And if you look at the proportion of that head, you want as much muzzle as you've got back skull. So as you can see there, that's a very well balanced head. Flat on top with a, a slight stop. And we don't want ears up at the top, because again, a, a dog that's running through, uh, you know, brambles, fields, they grip their ears. We want nice, low ears set low behind the back skull. A long, elegantly arched neck, so the dog can get down and catch prey, jump, twist and turn, and it should be muscular. And then we come on to a part that is one of the most difficult parts to get correct, and that is the shoulders and the upper arm. 
When a whippet moves, it should move like a toy soldier. So it should move long and low without really breaking. We don't want it to move like this. It needs to be efficient when it moves. The lay back of the shoulder blades there to the point of the shoulder to the elbow should be, when I set her up properly, like an arrow pointing forward. So the elbow is right back under the body when viewed in profile. The upper arm should be of almost equal length to the shoulder blade. And that gives the dog the capacity to move long and low like that. If a dog has got a short straight upper arm, it cannot reach forward and move across the ground. So that's why that angulation is so important. And when I come into Yorkshire Canaries, a comparison that I made and find fascinating actually, is that that angle we want through the legs, and I think Matt's got a cutaway shot of the, of the, um, the model. The Yorkshire Canary needs that break in its leg and that angle going up through its leg through the eye so it can get up into position, it gives the bird drive. And that is a comparison that I find fascinating between Whippets and Yorkshires. What we also want then is a well sprung rib, which should be two thirds the length of the dog to a third loin. The ribs should be well sprung because when a dog sprints, its respiratory system and its heart, they increase in size. So you need well sprung ribs. A firm line, and whilst we want this forward reach, a long daisy cutting action there, a long daisy cutting action there, we also need drive from behind and that's where all the power is. When you're moving a dog at a sure pace, this leg and that rear leg should meet and then it should be like that. So perfect coordination between the front and the back. If we look at the rear quarters, which is the powerhouse, the biggest muscle on the dog is there. This thigh should be really wide with a well-bent stifle and a low hock. From the pin bone to the base of the tail to the stifle to the hock are the rear quarters. They should be of almost equal length. If you get a dog with a really long second thigh, it will wobble behind. It might have a sickle thigh, which means it can't use the function of it properly. So everything should be balanced, but it should be shaped within moderation. What we also want is a stunning top line. So from behind the shoulder, we don't want a dip. We don't want a flat top line. We want a nice, gentle, elegant rise over the line. A low set sail, uh, a low set tail, sorry. And tremendous depth of brisket. We want a perfect S-shaped underline and a corresponding top line. It should stand naturally over lots of ground. And it's not the angles that make it stand over the ground, it's the length of body. We must have that length there, like a Yorkshire Canary. We want a long bird with a taper that stands in that correct position. All these angles will help that canary get there. They don't, it doesn't always work like that because some of them just don't, but if you can get that confirmation right, like I've, I've tried to explain here on a whippet, more often than not, you'll breed something that's not far away. So, as I've just spoke about them angles on a whippet, you can see here, and it's in black and white, and I'll just read through it, you, you can see where that thigh hits that Yorkshire canary and the angle at which it hits the bird you could draw a straight line right up through the angle of the eye and the lower leg right up to the shoulder. And it says here, imagine a line through the thigh extending directly through the eye. Similarly, a line extended through the leg will appear at the midpoint of the shoulder on a good exhibition specimen. So those angles, to me, are very important. They're the finer points of the breed but you've got to get them right and like we all know leg position on a bird is extremely important. So Russ we've just seen a very very stunning stunning Whippet who is Rosie is that right? Yep Rosie champion veered on another Rose. She was the, the top winning Whippet in the UK in 2021. It took me 25 years to do that, Matt, so she, she were overdue. <laughs> <laughs> 
But yeah, I'm very proud of her, and as I think you can just see there, she fits the standard. Yeah. Um, you can go over her from head to tail, and she ticks almost every box. And I think that's that's one of the things you know we've spoken to to it today, and you know we know you're starting your canary journey, Russ. So you're at the you're at the beginning of it. Mm. There is. Um, there's a scrapbook of all things that you're looking at that you've got so you've got that you've got that that focus and I think as as breeders as stockmen um, that's what we want we want that focus we want to understand you know ultimately what you know what we're looking for um, and in and in it, it fascinated me and I'm sure it'll fascinate the viewers to see you know a, a, a different a different species but some of the similarities and, and one of the things that you know you talked about is you know Matt it can have all of these things but then it's about how it performs exactly I think <clears throat> with with any top show specimen um, Donald Skinner Reed said it and it's true the best ones just do it yeah uh, you, you know you can have the best looking canary in a stock cage and you put it in a show cage and it's a different bird and it's same with dogs you, you can go over a dog when you're judging and think oh, this is absolutely stunning just move for me if you move I've got a I've got a dog here, yeah. th but they don't all do it, yeah. and I think it's same with birds. Yeah. The best ones just do it. Yeah. Um, Steve Domine wrote an article in Cage and Every Birds, which I've cut out and stuck in my my scrapbook, and he's so true that you can have a bird if it's got lovely long legs with correct angles, but some of them just don't get into that position. Yeah. Um, so we've got to keep breeding towards that model. But the best ones will just do it, I think. Yeah, yeah, you know. And it's, it's <laughs> if if only it were easy. Hey, it's, um, it's not. It's not. It's, it's not easy. Um, I think we auctions as well, and I don't want to sound like I know it all because I absolutely don't. I really am just just learning. Really, um, there's one or two things in whippets as you can see that lean towards Yorkshire. There's so many sim similarities. So I think I've got a, a like a kind of understanding of why that needs to be like that on a Yorkshire and why it's like that on a Whippet. Um, but with, with Yorkshires, I think you've got to have, in your room, especially when it comes to feather, different types of feather in your room. Yeah. Um, I've not been in anybody anybody's shed, shed yet, with, with the greatest of respect, where they've all got showbird feather. No. They haven't. You've got to have them different ingredients yeah. in, in your room. Yeah. And I'm learning that. Uh, as I say, I'm on, I'm on first step of learning that, but to breed a Yorkshire, which is of the size we want, it's got the length, the taper, the legs, and then to get showbird feather, and then it's got to get up on that top perch and be the guardsman of the fancy, that takes a bit of doing, yeah. You know, to ask a bird to do that, yeah. it's it's not easy, but it's fascinating, uh, and I'm enjoying moving up. You know, getting getting moving forward with them. Well, I have I have no doubt, Russ, that you will continue. You've had a, you know a good good start on the show bench already. You've had some early success already. We caught up with you at the YCC yeah. uh, last year, where you've done well. And I'm still on Gona from that. <laughs> <laughs> Rumour. It's a rumour, everyone. It's a rumour. You told me you didn't drink whiskey. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> maybe, maybe on occasion I might have the odd one. Um, and so what we've got here, uh, uh, talking about that, and again, I'm always fascinated by people's rooms. We've got <coughs> a kind of little show bench in front of the window here, haven't we? And, yeah. um, and this, this is ingenious. This is a typical Yorkshireman, this. Uh, and I mean that with the greatest of affection. No, it's, it's typical, true. Typical Yorkshireman. I was like, oh, that's really interesting staging. And it's... Trainer racks, <laughs> shoe racks. Shoe and racks. I, I got these from home bargains, and when when I was building new shed, I thought, right, one of the most important things is going to have to be a training bench. Um, obviously, I wanted it in front of windows for natural light. Um, but I were in home bargains, and I saw these, and I thought, absolutely ideal. So I've got a bit of storage underneath, and they're, they're at sort of eye level. Yeah, it's quite easy to replicate a show. You can put seven or eight Yorkshire show cages on there, or five cages, and it's 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 worked out well. Yeah, this is a confidential waste <laughs> cabinet that we're getting recycled from work, so that had to come, and that's worked out well. So yeah, the, yeah. the lotions and potions in there. He's got it. He's done it. He's done it all. He's done it all, <laughs> ladies and gents. Superb stuff. 
we're in the middle of the breeding season here. It looks like it's looks like it's a good season. There's plenty plenty of chicks around, which is nice, mm -hmm. and and uh, and plenty of chicks away, which is uh, which is nice as well. So um, the 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 breeding, the, the sort of I guess. The, the, the pedigree of things and, and you know putting birds together as we all know mm. it's not just about saying that's a pretty one and that's a pretty one it, th there's a lot more that goes into it in that and, and I guess mm. although you know you keep emphasising I don't want to relatively new to this game but actually pedigree stockmanship that's that's bread and butter for you with what you've done with the, with the rabbits and then the dogs yeah I think um, pedigree is very very important obviously we all know that our 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 particular bird or dog is bred um whilst pedigree i believe is extremely important the dog or the bird must be a very good example itself yeah it don't matter how good a pedigree is if you put your best two together and you breed crap and then you go in on crap more more often than not you're going <laughs> to breed <laughs> inferior birds or yeah. dogs so just as an, an example, about 15 years ago, um, there were a kennel in, in Cumbria, which I admired for a long time. And you're not actually allowed to do it now, but they'd done a father-daughter mating of a dog that had come in from Sweden, which was outstanding, and the top winning whippet in England. Um, again, probably my favorite whippet bitch at that time. And there was some related breeding behind them two parents. And I went up. And I still, to this day, cannot believe that when I inquired about that litter, the breeders had not had one inquiry for a puppy from that litter. Which, to me, I was thinking, if you're serious about whippets, you would be knocking their door down to get one of these pups. So I was fortunate, fortunate enough to buy a dog puppy. Richie, were called. Uh, Falcon Craig Valente. And that dog was worth his weight in gold because he was bred off to outstanding dogs with a line bred consistency behind them it were a very close mating which cemented that bloodline and when you looked at that pedigree you knew that the dogs behind those two parents were also top producers themselves yeah so some lines are just very potent in what they produce you can almost guarantee what you're going to get from them dogs and I think if birds are bred a certain way that should replicate itself in birds as yeah. well yeah. Um, that dog went on to produce three champions for me both reserve best dog and bitch at Crufts in 2011 and ten reserve CC winners um, and tragically he had an injury as quite a young dog and he could no longer make bitches but we had his semen frozen and even to this day, Seaman goes to other breeders all over the world. And once you've got a pedigree that is that strong, but just as importantly, outstanding examples themselves, yeah. then I think you're on to a winner. Yeah. Uh, Bob Pepper said to me, and I agree with, agree with him completely, that once you've fixed your type and your leg position, and your style of your bird, if you like, all you're going to do then is match your feather. Yeah. You're going to use them different feather types, but the type, ideally, would be the same. Yeah. Um, I'm only two years in, so I'm not there yet. But in theory, in 10 years' time, all these birds will be of a type, and we'd just be looking at matching feather. Now, whether we can get to that point, I don't know. But yeah. in theory, that's, that's ideally what you'd like. And in the fights as well, at Belgians. Get your line, get that type stamped in, and then use your feather and your finer points. Yeah. Right, so we've we've talked a lot about um, we talked a lot about the Yorkies. Got um, some away on the sticks, which is nice to see. Um, there is plenty of fifes away on the sticks, Ross. So there's there's fifes in this room at all. Was that my fault as well? <laughs> yeah, it were actually, Matt. Yeah, yeah. Scapegoat, are you? Yeah. <laughs> Got the shoulders, I'll take responsibility for it. So you've already had your better your first best in show with the fights. So again, get them for a few years. Mm. Um but they're here in the, they're here in their own right, aren't they? In they the are, room? they are. I mean, um to be honest, they came initially as feeders. Um I, I, I wanted uh just to make sure in case I needed them that I yeah. got feeders for Yorkshire's um, just to get me going really but again me being me 
once had cat fives. They're a very appealing bird. They're lovely personalities. They're yeah. inquisitive. Lovely to keep. Very easy breeders. Um, I find them quite easy. You can cut that if you want. I don't. No, I want you to <laughs> cut that. <laughs> They're re- relati- relatively easy breeders. And you can move them forward quickly, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, so I realised that I wanted not just fives, but best, best quality I could get, really. And yeah. let, let's have a go. If we're going to have them, let's try and get a nice competitive line going and uh, have a go with them. So that's what we've done. I was very fortunate last year to acquire some birds off uh, an established breeder uh, who got a really good bloodline. Um, so this is me, my first full breeding season with this line. Um, touch wood everything's gone very well from a, a breeding point of view yeah. the, the fertility's been excellent ends are rearing well um, everything up to now has gone, gone to plan so let's oh, we, we breed one or two nice ones and we, we'll get a, a show team out there later this year long may that continue you've got what what is also fabulous about here is you've got a um, you've got a what you're calling a molten shed well, now yeah that, that was actually my initial Yorkshire room yeah. Um, obviously like I said earlier I'd made mistakes it's it's north facing it's not quite big enough um, but now uh, I've sort of turned it into a malting room it's slightly darker yeah um, so it's going to be ideal for running youngsters on yeah uh, so that, that's what we're going to use it for yeah and there's, there's plenty as we can see here there's plenty of first round fives in there and there's one or two that caught my eye with a bit of nice shape on them and there's you know certainly more than one or two in the room now that have caught a nice bit of shape on them as well but not content with those not content with vice you've also you've also got you've got Belgiums Ross talk to me about the Belgiums well this is again your fault <laughs> okay. I watched uh, your episode with Donald yeah. Skinner Reed and when I saw the Belgians and I thought wow they're just so unique in the yeah. posture yeah um, I think different to almost every other bird that they're an angular bird yeah made out of triangles yeah um, and they're just so unusual and I thought yeah I really like them I thought oh, well, just drop Donald a message and see if he can uh, <laughs> sort me out with some stock so Donald's been extremely helpful he shared his knowledge and I'm very grateful grateful to him for that um, and we, we brought in two pairs um, Donald said oh you have to watch fertility because it might not be like five you might just get one or two uh, hatching out you know so you have to have perseverance well we've bred two nests four eggs and four have hatched in each so <laughs> we, we've bred eight up to now and they, they're away now we've weaned them off as you can see yeah. um, so I'm, I'm just starting to, to run them into show cages and start that, that training pro, uh, process um, which I, I just find them fascinating I don't think there's another, another canary like them and I'm, I really am passionate about but the bird fancy, the, yeah. the canary fancy, and it's a variety that it doesn't it doesn't need more people to keep them. It does, it does, and I think that what comes across, and I hope it comes across in the episode, and, and I, I hope it does, is there's a sort of there's an infectiousness about being in your company, Russ. There's a real passion. There is a willingness to learn, and there is an openness to learn, and I think that's you know testament in your your little scrapbook, which we'll have a look at. You've got your scrapbook with everything Yorkshire in it, all the articles. Mm-hmm. And there is that sort of, and I think that's what separates the the people who do very well in this fancy to for, from from the rest is that there's almost a sort of an absolute focus on absorbing as much information and knowledge and understanding, um, and I think that's you know great great credit to you. I think the Belgium the Belgium is a lovely bird. Um, it, it, it absolutely is, um, but just quickly just jumping back to Fice I think one of the best things that the Fice got going for I'm just looking at that Fice feeding that single Yorkshire cheek there um, um, yeah one of the best things that, that Fice have, have I think got going for them it's the competitiveness yeah. of the shows yeah. and the great breeders that come from that variety yeah. um, and 
Belgians, they just ain't got that. I th- I, you know, they, they're an old and rare variety, so they, they ain't got a specialist club here anymore. So you, you go to certain shows that would accommodate old and rare varieties, but why, why shouldn't they be popular? They, yeah. They're absolutely stunning. So I'm, I'm hoping uh, we can breed a few and, and you know, create create a line and let other people see them, get them out there. Yeah. yeah. I think with I think with all the sort of the old and rare, so whether that's the, you know, my neck of the woods, the Lancashire, well, it's a Lancashire copy now because that, that, when yeah, it's gone. regrettably went, yeah. um, and then you've seen the work that that the guys have done with the you know the London fancy and the work that Donald does mm. with with all of those apart from those. If you're watching this, Donald, I still don't like them gabozos, but, <laughs> but you know that. Um, but actually, all the work that Donald's done with the Scots and and, and with the Belgians, and I think that's what it needs. It needs those people with with a real passion. They, to me, the true bird men. Yeah. They genuinely care about the varieties they keep. And I'll, I'll, I hope Donald don't mind. When I went up to Donald, he'd sorted a particular hen out for me. And a couple of days before, he said, Russ, I'm not sure about this hen, it just don't look 100%. How many other people would have took me, mo- took me money off me and sent me home with an hen that weren't bang on just before breeding season? That guy sorted a different hen out that were bang on and she reared four chicks in a month. Yeah, yeah. That is a true bird man for me. They're the people that this hobby is all about. Yeah, it is, and it is, and thankfully there is a number of them. There is. Uh, which, yeah. is which is a really good thing. Well, ladies and gents, that's all we've got time for. Russ, you're a legend. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Matt. We will uh, we will keep an eye out for the name Russell Sykes because I'm sure it's one we'll see uh, a lot of um, in in the future. Um, and you've gone at you know great lengths and great pains to talk about you know this is your first steps, your tentative steps in the in the canary world. But I think you know when we we consider what you've done. With the whippets and various other things, Ross, and and the the approach, you know, and the bits that we've talked off off camera of of that sort of focus on building the lines up. I'm sure, and um, I'm sure you will continue to do um, incredibly well, mate. Incredibly Thank you, mate. Well. It's been a Le- pleasure. Thank you. Bless you. Well, listen, everyone, if you've enjoyed the show, and uh, to be honest, if you haven't enjoyed the show, I don't know what else we can do for you. <laughs> so, if you've enjoyed the show, hit the subscribe, hit the notification bell. Until next time, everyone. Take care. Thank you.